Hi guys, this is Alana. Welcome and thank you for joining us at the Praying Christian Women podcast. We are thrilled to have you here. Today we're going to be talking about the one component of prayer that nearly all of us neglect, and I'm sure you're dying to know what that is. But before we jump into our discussion, we're going to open with a word of prayer. God, we just thank you for this day and we just pray that you would be present with us and just... um Open our hearts and our minds to your teaching, to your spirit. Let our hearts become your heart, God. And we just uh, pray that you'd be glorified in this podcast. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Do you like the way I didn't give away the topic in the prayer? Normally I do. Right, yeah. I didn't give it away. Oh, yeah. But I'll give you a hint. Our verse of the day contains a really good clue. So our verse of the day is James 5.16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And this verse, I love the fact that it talks about confessing in relation to healing, you know, to that confession, it, it purges the infection of sin, you know, it, it's, it's actually a healing process. Um, and, and it makes us right before God, not that the atoning work of Jesus didn't make us right before God forever, but it, it purges us and, and, removes the prayer block of sin, um, and it makes us aware of that sin. So we're going to be talking today about the one component of prayer that nearly all of us neglect, and um, that is confession. Spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. (laughs) Well, what we like to do, if you're new to this podcast, is we like to start off with a just for fun question. So today I'm asking Jamie, what's the worst trouble you got into when you were a kid? The thing that comes to mind is just so silly. I was, I was a, a, you know, I was definitely a compliant child and I did not like to get in trouble, but at a, you know, the brownies, how they're part of Girl Scouts. Mm-hmm. So I was a brownie for one year and we went to this little camp where they had these bunks and the bunks kind of had like, we brought our sleeping bags, but the bunk itself, the, the mattress on it was kind of this like canvasy stuff that, that was, um, anyway, I took a pencil and I pretended, and, and I actually wrote, Jamie was here because I wanted to be rebellious in pencil, you know, and, wow. and so then, <laughs> so I did that. And then later on I pretended cause no one noticed that I did it. So I pretended to write so that they would notice. I mean, I didn't do this anyway. I'm not anyway. So one of my friends told on me and said, Jamie wrote her name on here. And I didn't get so much in trouble for writing in pencil, which could obviously be erased, but I lied about it. And I told my Brownie troop leader that it wasn't me. And I blamed it on my friend. It was horrible. I just, this is not me. Don't think less of me, people. This is, I, I was not a liar and a, and a, a blamer, but I was that's so actually upset. kind of mild, Jamie. <laughs> okay. But I just felt horrible. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Well, you know what? My worst trouble I got into is, um, yeah, some people who were super rebellious would just be rolling their eyes and laughing at us both. <laughs> That's you listening. We love you and we envy you <laughs> for having the courage to have the fun. We didn't. Just kidding. But um, I was part of a junior high youth group and my parents were out of town and I was staying at a ladies from our church for a little bit. And I asked to go over to spend some time with another friend from youth group. And she said, sure. And we baked cookies And we put the cookies on plates and we made little cards and we went doorbell ditching, except when we doorbell ditched, we left a plate of cookies on the porch for people. And her mom was real sweet and drove us around. So we went, you know, to basically to people from youth group's house that we knew. And eventually it got kind of dark. And so it was, you know, after the sunset and we had one more house to go to. And we knew this girl very, very well, and we could hear the TV on in her house. And so we rang the doorbell, and then we hid behind some bushes and waited, but nobody came to the door. So by this point, we had had a ton of fun doorbell ditching all night. So we rang the doorbell again, and still no one came. And so then we thought it would be a great idea to, like, pound on the door and shout things like, we know you're in there, let us in. 
And what happened was our friend's mom was home alone, didn't feel comfortable opening the door at night because she didn't know who it was. And then she heard people pounding on her door, screaming, let us in. So she called her neighbor who came running out of the lawn, shouting, what are you doing? And it turned out that my friend's mom was pretty close with the family from church that I was staying with. So called them and I got pretty uh, badly lectured <laughs> about, oh, no. about making cookies for people. Wow. That is but pretty you know tame. What? Now that I am a mom. I don't answer the door after it's dark if I don't know who it is. You know, like right. I totally get that now. Yeah. But back then, they're like, we just wanted to give you cookies. Well, and just for the record, our question was, what's the worst trouble you got into as a kid? I did get into a little bit of worse trouble as a teenager. I will just leave it at that. Ah, okay. Yeah. We'll save that for another show. Yeah, or, or not. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's a great segue into our topic today, which is confessing. And I think when people think about confession, there are sort of two different ways. So we think of confessing our sins to God in prayer and also confessing to each other, which is sort of what our verse of the day was talking about. So we'll touch a little bit on both, but mostly how we need to be making confession a regular part of our daily prayer routines. So some of this is going to be basic, but we just want to spell out. I think it's one of those things, like sometimes there are things in prayer life that I kind of relate to flossing your teeth. Like everyone knows you should do it and everyone knows why you should do it, but not everybody does it. <laughs> and so why is confession so important? Well, we touched on it with the, the scripture from James, you know, confess your sins, pray for each other that you may be healed. And there's an inner healing, I think, that comes from regular purging of the things that we know to confess. Mm -hmm. um, and it also says the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And, you know, the definition of righteous is right with God. And like I said, Jesus made us right with God once and for all. But there are things that the Bible talks about that block our prayers and, and block our ability to pray um, in God's will because we're not connected to him because of something standing in the way. And so I think it frees us to pray with more power as well. Um, Definitely. Yeah, I think that that's a really good point, that if we have a whole lot of unconfessed sins that have built up, it does really hinder our prayers. I had a friend talk about a similar concept in the um, uh, context of marriage and how if every single time you and your spouse get upset with each other, imagine it's like crumbling up one piece of paper and throwing it halfway in the room and you're sitting you know, on opposite sides of the room. Well, no, that one piece of paper isn't going to do anything. But if that goes on for decades, pretty soon that pile is going to be so big you can't see each other, you know, and it's going to block your communication. So... I think one of the biggest problems that I struggled with with confession was I sort of saved it for just the really big things. Mm -hmm. So basically it was kind of, yeah, I'm doing all right. If I hit a major roadblock, I'm going to ask God for help. You know, like if I'm really struggling with the sin so much that I can't get out of it. And I've since switched to try to think about it just in terms of, I think it's Beth Moore who talks about keeping short accounts with God, you know, so like mm -hmm. end of every day going through the things from that day so they don't build up. Right. And, you know, what, what I found is that when I start being intentional and regular, then I think of more things that it's, it's not just the things that are just blaring, you know, in the front of your mind, but it's, you start thinking of more things. It's like peeling back layers and, and not for the sake of discouragement, but for the sake of, of getting it out of there, you know, and purging it from, from inside or becoming aware of it. And, for sure. um, and the each other part is important too, because, you know, obviously God, God hears us and we can confess to God. But this scripture in James talks about confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. There is importance in confessing to each other, not just to God, as much as 
it's important to confess to God. And there are certain things that maybe you don't want to confess to others, but, but there is an important element and component of confessing to another person because for it, sure. Yeah. And I, I think that accountability, um, and also just there's freedom. I think it's the idea of confession can seem scary, but there is such a freedom once you say it out loud. And then that other person is freed to say their confession out loud. And then you can pray for each other and realize that it's a positive thing and it opens doors. I think the enemy would love to get a foothold in our lives and make us feel isolated like, oh, nobody has that struggle, which is kind of why I was like, well, you know, I did have other things as a teenager because I don't want you know, make it seem like I was perfect or, you know, I, I always, I don't know. I, I admire so much people that aren't afraid to let it be known that they're not perfect, even in specific ways. I don't know. Absolutely. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really glad you brought in the, the additional concept of confessing sins to each other. And just like it's a good practice to make confession part of a daily prayer routine, it can be really good practice to make confession part of a prayer partnership or an accountability. So for example, Jamie and I, before we record an episode, we have a moment where we just say, hey, what do you have to confess? And then what do you have to confess? And it took us a while to get comfortable with that. You know, we were super comfortable as prayer partners and we were super comfortable, you know, closing our conversations with how can I be praying for you? We prayed together a ton, but it was a few years before we started making confession regular. Until then, it was just one of those really big, scary things that if there was a major big struggle, you might find the courage to bring it up. But now I find that since I know that when we record, we're going to ask each other this, it also helps me to become aware of things throughout the day. You know, oh, I'm going to have to remember to tell Jamie this. Well, and there have even been times when... I'll say, oh, I knew that there was something that came to mind. And I thought, oh, because I knew that we were going to record and we were going to talk about it. But I couldn't remember it once we came together. But that the day before, you know, I was aware of it and I confessed it to God right then and there. And I thought, well, I guess maybe maybe I'm done with that and that's okay. So, you know, even if you don't get to the point of confessing it out loud to someone, um, just to get your mind used to thinking in terms of of checking, you know, like the little red flag going up when, when you check yourself. Yeah. Right. Kinda right. Cool. It's a great habit to get into. One thing that I do in my prayer journal at the end of the day, I list the things I'm grateful for. And then I also have a section where I list what I need to confess. And here's another thing about confession. It doesn't have to just be the things you did wrong. You can also be confessing your temptations. You can be confessing your struggles, even adding some corporate confession. I've started to try to incorporate that more into my prayer routine. Um, you know, so <clears throat> just something like, I'm trying to think of who it was in the Bible with um, the king. It was Nehemiah. And how in his prayers to God, he wasn't just confessing the things that he did wrong. He was confessing the sins of the entire nation of Israel to the Lord. And it wasn't in a way of, oh, God, I'm so glad that I don't do these sins. It was, God, have mercy on us. These are the things that we do. And so even adding some corporate confession can be a really strong, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just a strong habit to get into. Yeah. And you know, there was a time when I was just praying um, one morning before church in our church in Arizona, and I was just overcome with just this feeling of, I don't know why, but I kind of started crying while I was praying. And I was praying for the church and just kind of praying in general, but I felt this like tremendous sorrow. And I just, um, I felt led to repent on behalf of our church. And it's not like we were going through this horrible thing, but I just, you know, the Bible talks about that and how confession and repentance on a larger scale can bring down God's power. And, and I think it is something that, you know, definitely is, is something I never, until you said that, I had never really thought about that as like a regular thing to strive for, but that really is powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 You know, what got me thinking about it is I've had this horrible 
eye dryness. And I know I've told you about it, Jamie, but Mm -hmm. my eyes have hurt so much because they're just so dry. I can't even read anymore. And I was joking with my husband and he just said, oh, well, do I need to make you cry? (laughs) And I started to think it's been a long time since I actually have cried. I'm like, you know, maybe having a good cry would be helpful. (laughs) And there was something about that. I was just reminded of that conversation when I was praying later that day. And somehow the connection was made in my spirit that I, there are things that we need to mourn over, Mm -hmm. you know, going on in this world and not in this judgmental, hypocritical, you know, thank God I'm not like that tax collector sort of Mm -hmm. mentality like we see in the story of the Pharisee, but really in a God have mercy on us. We are sinners. Yeah, that's a really good point. And yeah, that's, I'm, I'm interested to hear what other people think about that also, or if you've had an experience with corporate confession, um, share that with us because that's, you know, something that I, we don't hear a lot about. So that'd be interested, interesting to hear if other people have had experiences with that. You know what? I heard a really interesting correlation at one point. Someone actually did an academic study about some of the most significant spiritual Christian revivals mm-hmm. that have happened in the past few hundred years. And they start, were you the one who told me this even? Maybe it I was. I don't know. It was, yeah, no, I don't know if I told you about it, but I know okay. that we talked about it. One of us yeah. told me. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, you know, they, they almost all, or maybe they all start with, a public confessing of sins and it's not a planned thing it's just that god's spirit falls so heavily that people have no choice but to confess and to do so publicly which is important well so our church in um uh in virginia when i was in college the church that i went to um i don't know what started it and i don't know it was just a sermon was preached about either confession or repentance i don't know what but people, there was, a, there was an invitation from the pastor, if anyone wanted to come up and confess like publicly, like in front of the church with the microphone. And at first it was kind of quiet. And then someone, one person came up and then another person came up by the end of, I mean, there was a line and the service had to be delayed. And the, the second service had to meet in a different room, or maybe we moved into a different room to continue. It was so powerful. And it was, um, yeah, it, it was very powerful. And it wasn't a like confession on behalf of the church. It was individual confessions, but it was really, really powerful and cleansing. I'm sure. Mm-hmm. I was a kid and we had a decent sized church. You know, it's like in the probably tens of thousands now. And at that point, you know, at least several hundred and, you know, a couple different ser- service times. And I remember being absolutely struck. I don't remember a ton from that church, but I do remember one point where they were getting ready to serve communion and the pastor stopped the sermon, walked down. It was to the point where the church had grown big enough that they needed parking attendance. And the pastor had been in a rush and had gotten a little bit huffy with the parking attendant. And he stopped the sermon. He was so convicted and realized that he couldn't take communion, you know, let alone administer communion with that still between him and this guy. And so he walked down, he publicly apologized. And if I remember right, you know, like I was probably only like five or something. I I think I was really young, but the memory still stayed with me. And if I remember right, the parking attendant like hadn't even realized that this had been a thing you know like it might have been more the you know like under your breath or rolling your eyes but it really stood out to me that our pastor of all people would lead in this way by example to confess like that yes and I we had a pastor um at a church that we attended and there was something that happened between him and someone else and it was a misunderstanding um personally, I didn't see that he had committed a sin, but that other person had taken offense. And so he stood up in front of the congregation and he actually came person by person. It was a small church. He came person by person and, you know, he confessed publicly and then person by person, he asked forgiveness. Um, And that also stood out to me, just how powerful that can be. So, you know, for people that are in positions of authority of any kind, it can be really powerful to set that example and put it out there. And even if you're a parent. Yeah. Yeah. 
going yeah. to your kids and saying, you know, I'm sorry, I kind of lost my cool. Mm -hmm. Will you forgive me to show them what that means by example? One thing that we do with our kids, you know how parents, if your kids get in a fight, they'll be like, okay, now say you're sorry. We have really specific guidelines. It's you need to say, I am sorry for, you know, and mention what you're sorry about. Mm -hmm. And then to say the words, will you please forgive me? And mm -hmm. that's something that my husband and I implemented when we get into struggles with each other. That's hard hard to say. It's so much easier to say, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry too. But to go, I'm like, will you please forgive me? And, mm -hmm. you know, and to respond, yes, I forgive you. It can. And it, it does, whether you're talking about reconciliation between two individuals or in your personal relationship with God, it keeps those barriers down between you. Mm -hmm. Something else that I really like about confessing to others, you know, you had already talked about just the accountability and also sometimes you realize, oh, this sin that I thought was so horrible and I was the only one in the world, <laughs> this other person's struggling with too. And I think another benefit that can come from confessing sins to each other, I think especially as women, is I think that sense of vulnerability can create just deeper friendships and deeper intimacy it can. Now, what do you think? Because I've heard some people, I've heard two different things, and I don't really know exactly where I stand. Um, what do you think about the idea that you should be careful? Like, for instance, this, when I heard this, I was in a ministry to teenagers. Um, I was a young adult. And one of the leaders said, you don't want to glorify the sin. So don't be specific in all cases of what the sin was. Um, I could see that like, you know, if you're a youth pleader and you're talking to someone who's struggling with physical boundaries, for example, no, I don't think you need to go into vivid detail about what your struggles were. I think just saying, hey, I was there too. I think that makes sense. But when it's more of the peer to peer, mm -hmm. I do feel like in general, when you get specific, that can take some of the shame away. Yeah. I could see that. So if you're in a position of authority and influence, while it's good to be transparent, you know, like with your kids, you're not going to give them details of every single struggle at every single time, or they could take exactly. that as permission. Um, but to, yeah, definitely with peers or an accountability partner, there can be that complete transparency. Yeah. And, you know, this is a, a really good thing to keep in mind when you're praying for your pastor, because it's really hard. Who does a pastor go to? You know, right. when my husband was pastoring a church, if he had a struggle, he was blessed to have another pastor friend that he was real close to that they went to Bible college together. But there are some pastors who don't have that at all. Or missionaries. I heard a really sobering and heartbreaking statistic about the degree of spousal abuse that happens on the mission field because people can be so removed from accountability. And it just turns into when you have a struggle, who do you tell? If I tell my sending church, they're going to, you know, stop sending us a check. If I tell my missionary agency, they're going to say I'm not qualified and I'm going to lose my job. It can be very, very scary. And so, I think it's important for all of us to be praying for our pastors. And I think that sense of just accountability is very important. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we are so glad that you guys joined us today. And I would uh, love to keep on giving you guys lots of fun. That was so silly. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm saying. I'm trying to make like a very smooth segue. That was a bad segue. Here's the good segue. We would love to have you subscribe to the podcast. We are going to continue to be talking about issues of prayer, what it means to be a praying woman in the 21st century, how we can be encouraging each other with our prayers and deepen our, deepening our relationship with God together on a journey. So please hit subscribe and we would love to stay connected with you guys. And we'd like to close our show with a blessing and benediction. So your blessing today says, may God enlarge your ministry today. May he widen the place of your impact. May the anointing of the Holy Spirit equip you for every good deed that God has prepared in advance for you to do. May he strengthen and encourage you in your calling because you know that the labor in the Lord is not in vain. May the author and perfecter of your faith bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. 
And our benediction is, uh, comes from Romans chapter 8, 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.